In 1994, Tanya Frazier lived in the Mount Baker neighborhood in southeast Seattle with her mother and sister. The 14-year-old tomboy was sweet and generous, always bringing joy to those around her, despite her slightly shy disposition. She was an altar server at St. Clement's Episcopal Church and spent the day of July 17th at a church picnic. She participated in potato sack races and told fellow parishioners about her new haircut. The following day, Monday, July 18th, 1994, Tanya had summer classes at Mimi Middle School in the morning. She was last seen leaving the school around 11 a.m., as expected. She was then supposed to take the bus to get to her part-time job at a thrift store on Jackson Street, run by the Chicken Soup Brigade, a local nonprofit. Tanya did not arrive home at 6 p.m. as expected, so her mother Teresa went to the thrift store to look for her. She learned that Tanya had never arrived for her scheduled shift. Teresa then went to Meany Middle School to look for Tanya, but there was no sign of her there. Teresa contacted the police to report Tanya missing around 7.30 p.m. Police did not seem to view Tanya's disappearance as an urgent matter. They repeatedly tried to get her younger sister to say that Tanya had plans to run away from home and referred to Tanya as a runaway throughout their initial report. This was an important distinction because while a missing child would have a detective assigned to their case, a runaway would only be assigned a community service officer. An officer spoke to two of Tanya's friends and called Teresa a few days later to ask if she had heard from Tanya. Tanya's mother did not believe her daughter had run away, both because it would have been out of character for her and because of practical considerations. If Tanya had left on her own accord, she had done so without any of her belongings or any money. At the time she disappeared, Tanya was excitedly waiting for her first paycheck from her part-time job, which she was due to receive in just a few days. She planned to use the money to buy pagers for herself and for her 12-year-old sister, Tira. Tira herself was another reason why no one who knew Tanya believed she had run away. Tira and Tanya were very close and were described as soulmates. Tanya would almost certainly never have gone anywhere without Tira and would have at least talked to her if she had any plans to leave. Tira spent the night after Tanya disappeared with her bedroom window open, just in case Tanya came home. While she could not imagine Tanya running away, the idea of something bad happening to Tanya was even more difficult to fathom. Tanya's church quickly came together to organize on Tanya's behalf when she disappeared. Corporate policies prevented them from posting flyers in many stores, but they still covered the area in over 1,500 missing persons posters. The police have a hell of a task. I want to be supportive of that. Father Ralph Karskadden, Tanya's pastor, told the media, but I also feel that had Tanya not come from our neighborhood or not been mixed race, would more people have known this terrible thing had happened to her? On July 23, 1994, Five days after Tanya went missing, a 62-year-old man was walking his dog along East Highland Drive when he noticed the smell of death. He had become familiar with that smell during his time serving during the Korean War. He stepped into a wooded area along the street and saw someone lying at the base of a tree at the bottom of a ravine. He stared at the person for several seconds before he fully processed the fact that he was looking at a human body. The body belonged to Tanya Frazier, who had been stabbed to death. The medical examiner believed she had not been killed until July 20th, two days after her disappearance. This caused fear in Tanya's mother, Teresa, that the police initially dismissing her daughter as a runaway may have resulted in her death. From the first report, I often wondered if they took it as more serious, if they looked in that first 24 hours, would there have been a chance she maybe would have been saved? That's a big question, she later told the Seattle Times. Tanya's community came together to mourn her loss. A memorial was established near where her body was found, and members of her church took to the streets for walks of remembrance. It was a member of her church who donated the cemetery plot where Tanya would be buried. Tanya had a routine of picking out one of her stuffed animals to take with her on her walk to school every day. Other students now took up this habit. 
Tanya was last seen alive at 21st Avenue and East Thomas Street, approximately 11 blocks away from where her body would later be found. Her friends reported seeing her speaking to an unfamiliar, unkempt man. This man has so far never been identified. Despite the best efforts of her loved ones, Tanya's case received little media attention. Talking about her daughter's murder was unbearable for Teresa, but she tried to find any opportunity to do so that she could in order to keep the case in the news and hopefully reach a witness who could help solve the case. Flyers posted by Crime Stoppers generated just three calls to the tip line, none of which helped advance the investigation. Private investigator Rose Winquist began working with Tanya's family the week she went missing. She continues to work on the case and forwards every credible lead she finds to the police. Seattle police detective Rolf Norton, who has been the lead investigator on Tanya's case since June of 2016, says that there are numerous persons of interest in the case, none of whom will be cleared until the case is definitively solved. Despite the fact that almost 30 years have passed since Tanya's murder, her sister Tira is still hoping that one day the case will be solved. I am hopeful. I can't imagine this just never being solved and never having that closure. So I'm hopeful that it will be she said in 2023.